Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your evenings to join uh, this event. It's a real pleasure and honor to be sharing with you today our fourth of our Clinical Innovators Network series and our third of our specific module looking at AI and artificial intelligence. My name is Nadine Hashash Haram. I'm a consultant plastic surgeon and I'm the clinical lead for innovation across Guys and St. Thomas's. And it's a real pleasure for me to be kickstarting this session off, but most importantly, to be introducing you to the event share, who will be introducing you as well to the wonderful guests who have volunteered their time as well to talk about some of the key topics we'll be exploring today. As you would have seen in the previous series around artificial intelligence and AI, we've really been trying to understand and talk about the applications of artificial intelligence in the NHS with experts in the field who've come and shared their experiences and their solutions that they've been designing to address some of the fundamental challenges that we see in day-to-day -day frontline healthcare. But of course, I think it's important to also introduce and make sure that it's clear that there are still challenges that persist in how we introduce and translate these innovations and these solutions. But more importantly, how do we then trace back the value back to clinical care and clinical practice? And at a more granular level, when we think about translating these solutions and these technologies, how do we do that across the continuum of care delivery from data, commissioning, process, engagement, KPIs and expectations, and ultimately measuring value? And so we really need to think about how do we overcome these barriers and how do we make sure that not only are we telling you about exciting innovations and the problems that they're solving, but also how at a practical level can we deliver this? As of many of you know, at GSCT we've, and, and with our, our KHP partners at large, we've really been trying to drive much more around culture of innovation, the translation and usefulness of technological uh, solutions, innovative pathways, clinical improvement and care redesign. And so through that, of course, the Clinical Innovators Network is a great forum for us to share all those things that are happening, bring awareness and raise awareness to solutions and, and, and ideations and prototypings that are happening in everyday practice in our frontline, both from our scientists, our clinical teams, our academics, but also the broader healthcare workforce um, equilibrium across the trust. So I'm really excited that this is the fourth of, of a number of series. This was a brainchild of ours about a year ago, and this has now come to fruition. And we've managed to in excite so many great speakers to come and volunteer their time, but more importantly, so many uh, participants who are listening in and learning. I would also wanna echo that this is the first of hopefully many. We want these sessions to be useful, to be meaningful, but more so not to just be high blue sky thinking sessions, but things that are applicable to day-to-day -to -day practice. And it's finding that balance of sharing where the future is taking us, but also how can this solve the challenges that we face today? And how can we do that? What can we do and how do we translate to optimize the delivery of care for the patients that we're so proudly looking after on a day to day basis? And so please do share feedback, share ideas, uh, register your interest for other topics that you think could be meaningful or useful within your clinical practice or what you're doing in your job within the trust or within the broader healthcare NHS community. And I really want to send a special thank you to Aidan and Matt, who've been working fiercely behind the scenes to make sure that everything runs smoothly, that you're all online and that you've got all access to the session. So a big thank you to you both. Without further ado, um, my in, in my session now, what I'm going to do is just introduce the event chair. Uh, Harris Shuaib, and I'll ask him to introduce the fantastic speakers who I've had the pleasure of working alongside for a year or so now. Harris is uh, an incredible partner on this journey of uh, clinical innovation and clinical computing. He's a consultant physicist and head of the clinical scientific computing at Geyser St. Thomas's. He's also the AI transformation lead for the Artificial Intelligence Center for Value-Based Healthcare. And beyond that, there's 10 other things that he's involved in, but I'll spare him his, his blushes. He's incredibly thoughtful about how we think about translation and value, and just really demonstrates that value of bringing together great engineering, academia, and healthcare practices to really translate and fundamentally uh, look at how do we change things for the better, not just using the word AI or artificial intelligence for the sake of using nice, big, shiny words, but actually, how are we doing it at a, at a frontline level for value? And he's often well sought after by a lot of the big NHS groups that are looking at applications of AI, 
but more broadly as well, international groups that are thinking about how do you translate these solutions into big health systems and complex health systems like ourselves. So we're very lucky to have him as part of our team at GSTT um, and at the broader sort of KHP patch. So Harris, thank you so much for making time on your holiday to be here. I'm incredibly grateful. You're at a massively different time zone and you've still managed to dial in, so thank you. And it's a pleasure to have you. It's a pleasure to have our fantastic speakers today. And thank you to all the participants who have joined. It's really appreciated. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, Nadine, for a very kind introduction. Yes, I'm joining everybody from snowy Vancouver. Uh, time isn't too bad. It's 10 a.m. here. And um, uh, I'm, I'm really proud to have the honor to, to be able to host this panel and particularly in light of the guests that we have um, joining us today. And, and as Nadine's pointed out, we'll be focusing on really the practical challenges, things that we have all experienced uh, in terms of the panelists in our in our day to day jobs working in the NHS um, and in associated organizations trying to overcome some of these challenges to deploy AI really at scale. Um, for it to achieve the transformation that we all think it's it's capable of um, with this new technology. So I'll start by introducing the panelists and then I'll I'll do a bit more of a deep dive into some of the challenges that we'll be covering today. So uh, I, I'm joined by Dr. Danny Ruter uh, and potentially we can change screens so he can give us a bit of a wave. Uh, Dr. Danny Ruter is the AI clinical lead at, at Guy's Cancer Centre and he chaired in fact our second event in, in this AI series, so the one before this one. Uh, Danny's had a very esteemed career. He's formerly held post as Director of Public Health for the London Borough of Lewisham and also the City of Newcastle. And he was also seen a lecturer in epidemiology and health services research at Newcastle University uh, and Dundee University. So thanks Danny for joining us and, and we work together very closely um, at, at GSTT um, and we'll hear more about that work hopefully when, when Danny gets an opportunity. Um, next, we have Dr. Anna Barnes uh, on the panel. Anna is the director of the King's Technology Evaluation Center, otherwise known as KITEC. Up until June this year, Anna was lead clinical scientist at UCLH um, on the other side of the river from us, and uh, she was tasked with introducing uh, a new type of scanner that combined PET imaging and MRI imaging, so a PET MRI scanner in their newly built Macmillan Cancer Center. Uh, over Anna's 20 year career as a clinical scientist, she's held positions all over, um, including the Glasgow Institute of Neurology, New York University Pet Imaging Center, as well as GE Healthcare's Radio Pharmaceutical Development Team, Columbia University FMRI Psychology Lab, and the University of Cambridge Brain Mapping Unit. Thank you so much, Anna, for joining us. Next on the panel, we have Dr. Mike Nix. I know Mike really well. We were both Topple Fellows in the in the first inaugural cohort of the Topple Fellowship. Mike is an AI researcher and also a clinical scientist in adaptive radiotherapy. He holds a joint fellowship at the moment with Health Education England and NHS X, where he's investigating the appropriate confidence levels and ethical implications for the implementation use of AI in the clinic. He's particularly interested in uncertainty and risk quantification for robust and safe clinical decision making, and particularly focused around the skill gaps and educational needs of the UK healthcare workforce in this area. Uh, and last but definitely not least, uh, we're joined by Dr. Neelan Das. He's a senior consultant cardiovascular and interventional radiologist at Kent and Canterbury Hospital. He's leading on the implementation of AI tools within the Division of Imaging at East Kent Hospital's Foundation Trust and has published on the ethics of AI in radiology. Neilan also leads on research and is the local PI on, in several cutting edge trials utilizing interventional radiology techniques, medical imaging and advanced technology. Uh, thank you all so much uh, for joining the panel. And, and like I said, um, uh, you'll hear uh, in more detail about each, each of their work uh, in turn, but I'm going to start by first sharing some slides around what the problem is. Um, uh, a lot of you, particularly if you're in the academic or technology space, um, might feel that, you know, once you have a, an AI product that's been developed and you've got regulatory approval, and maybe even if you've got a first few customers, that, you know, all the big challenges have been dealt with. Um, but indeed, there, there are a few more uh, if, you, if we really want to achieve scale uh, in the NHS. Um, so I'm just going to share my slides here and put them to, to full screen. 
and I'll I'll start with the the fundamental question um, that uh, that should be in everybody's mind when we're talking about AI in the NHS, which is why we're not routinely using these technologies as part of our clinical day to day lives. And if you think about it, this is a, a really helpful graphic <clears throat> developed by the Medical Futurist. Um, and it's actually slightly out of date. Um, it's only up to, I think, late 2019. And um, it shows all of the different FDA approved algorithms for AI in medicine. And the list for European approved algorithms is roughly the same. And you can hopefully see on the right hand side that it spans, you know, lots of medical specialties and some of them you'd expect things like cardiology, radiology, um, as well as others uh, um, like uh, psychiatry, um, pathology as well. If we were to think about the sort of typical development life cycle of, of an AI technology, it would look something like this. Obviously, this is a, a simplified version of it. It doesn't take into account the cyclic nature of, of the process. However, we know that ultimately it starts with the curation of data. And, and there's lots of efforts uh, to facilitate that. We have open data sets that are published by various hospital and research groups around the world. We have lots of investment in technology that makes it easier for subject matter experts to annotate data. Uh, we then get on to model development or AI development. Uh, and of, again, this is an area with very rich investment and development. This is primarily driven by academic departments like uh, our one at, uh, at King's College London, the School of Biomedical Engineering, um, as well as private companies like Facebook's AI Research Lab, um, Amazon and the like also develop AI algorithms and publish them freely uh, for others to use and, and to build upon. And then once you have a model that's been developed on curated data, the next stage you probably want to achieve is regulatory approval. And, and while there is some uncertainty here about how best to, for example, approve technologies that are dynamic and constantly learning, at the moment we've only been dealing in, in the real world in, in healthcare with algorithms that are uh, frozen in, in terms of their learning. And, and regulatory bodies, like the Medical Futurist has pointed out, have been improving, approving plenty of these algorithms. The next stage, however, is local deployment and evaluation of algorithms and software in individual hospitals or healthcare institutions. And this is where you find out, does this algorithm work for us? And this is where there are a lot of challenges around deployment, uh, lots of inefficiencies and problems that are left to be unsolved. And up to very recently, it's not been clear whose responsibility this is to figure out and who should be working on it and who should be investing in it. And if we don't have efficient ways of locally evaluating AI technologies, then we can never achieve routine clinical deployment uh, of AI. And I want to just outline some of the reasons why local evaluation and just the routine deployment of AI can present so many challenges. Um, this is an example that hopefully uh, many of you will be familiar with from a very famous uh, US paper, I think from MIT. Uh, and it's showing you here an example of an AI technology which is able to classify a dermatoscopic image of a benign lesion. And in this scenario, the algorithm correctly classifies the algorithm, uh, the, the lesion as benign um, with 100% confidence. However, if we were to slightly alter this image um, by adding some what we call adversarial noise. Uh, so this is noise that's been specifically designed to trick uh, the algorithm. We create the image on the right hand side, which is our adversarial example. Now to the human eye, it's imperceptibly different. Uh, you, you, you can't see any obvious differences that the adversarial noise has added. However, for the algorithm now, you can see on the bottom, it now classifies that same lesion as malignant and with as much confidence as it had before in the benign classification. And this unintuitive and non-linear relationship between inputs and outputs makes it very difficult for humans to understand the risks that are presented by, by AI algorithms and to be able to predict their behavior. Uh, another example is, is one based on text and natural language processing. And obviously you can see this in an American paper because it's about opioid abuse risk and reimbursement. 
in the first example, in the top row, you have a patient who's described as having a history of back pain and chronic alcohol abuse, and the algorithm has classified their opioid abuse risk as high, and therefore they're likely not to be uh, prescribed any opioid-based painkillers. However, if we were to substitute these words, which would to most people be considered synonyms, so back pain, lumbago for back pain, alcohol dependence for alcohol abuse, suddenly the algorithm now thinks the opioid abuse risk is low and the um, painkiller can be dispensed. In the, in the other scenario, uh, we have a reimbursement situation and a patient is described as having um, a history of metabolic syndrome and reimbursement for this patient is denied. However, if we were to substitute metabolic syndrome for its component uh, diseases, i.e. high blood pressure, high cholesterol and high blood sugar, then the reimbursement is suddenly approved. However, it's not, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, there are obviously very unique benefits to, to AI technology. This is an example of a, a chest X-ray um, that uh, three radiologists um, have classified as normal. However, when a chest X-ray detecting algorithm had a look at it, it was able to find a primary adenocarcinoma behind the clavicle. And it's these kinds of opportunities which, which motivate uh, a lot of us working in this space to be able to find a way to effectively and efficiently deploy these algorithms while managing those outstanding risks. And in, in the experience that we've had over the past couple of years, we've, we've grouped the challenges into, into these broad topics, which the panel members will be touching on uh, in their portion. One of the first challenges you have to overcome is system integration. Does the algorithm speak to our information systems that exist already in the hospital? Is it able to receive the medical images from our medical imaging information systems, i.e. our PAC systems? You know, does it speak to our radiology information system, i.e. RIS? Um, does it speak to our EHRs uh, and the rest? Next, we get to clinical integration. And this is, you know, does the AI algorithm integrate in the way that we deliver healthcare? And, um, you know, if I'm, if I'm running a clinic, uh, which is a one-stop clinic, and I need my results for my patient within a, a five-minute five window so that I can manage their care while they're still here, it doesn't help if the AI algorithm takes 24 hours to return a result. Um, and those are some of the challenges that, that we face when we're trying to integrate things into a clinical workflow. The next group of challenges we have are, is around training and education, uh, and it's something Dr. Mike Nix will, will talk to, and, and that encompasses a whole host of things. Um, you know, are we equipping our staff with the knowledge and know-how to understand, you know, the risk and benefits involved? Are we equipping them with the right statistical and data science knowledge to be able to integrate some of the outputs of these algorithms into their clinical decision-making? The next set of challenges are around um, effectiveness. You know, just because a technology does something cool and impressive, it doesn't mean it has any impact on patient outcomes. Uh, and hopefully Dr. Anna Barnes will be touching on this in her talk, um, laying out some of the methods and initiatives that are in place to help us um, understand how uh, effective AI technologies are and how to compare AI technologies with one another to see which are most effective. Uh, and then finally, sustainability. And what I mean by sustainability here is, is are all the benefits of the AI technology still realizable, still present when all of the hype has died down? You know, when it's not the flavor of the month, when all the attention and the funding has gone away, does is the technology robust enough? Are the benefits uh, sturdy and strong enough to still be there when um, all the extra resources uh, have uh, have gone away. Uh, and hopefully um, Dr. Danny Ruta will, will touch on this and he'll talk a bit more around how we're developing some industry standards to support hospitals in making some of the decision making um, around purchasing AI algorithms in, in a way that's uh, much more efficient and, and sustainable. So I'm, I'm briefly going to touch on my topic, which is around system integration. And, and what, in order to talk about this, I want to briefly talk about history. Um, 
in this image on the on the left hand side in 1895, you see one of the first ever images from an X-ray tube uh, that was taken by Wilhelm Röntgen. Um, it's mistakenly thought to be R Röntgen's wife, but I'd recently learned that it's not. It's in fact uh, an assistant or a technician, and and it took almost a hundred years from the invention of the X-ray for us to achieve uh, a system of uh, digital storage and transfer of images. Obviously, we have to wait for the advent of computing and all the rest. But either way, the point is, is that the invention of medical imaging really didn't catch fire, really didn't lead to the kind of transformation that it has led to today without that step um, that happened in 1995, where today we have scenarios that you could be in England and have your head CT taken you know, at midnight in a DGH, and it could be sent to Australia for reading almost immediately, um, thanks to the DICOM protocol. And we're at a similar stage with, with AI technology. So in, you know, about a decade ago, we had the first glimpses of what was possible uh, when applying deep learning or AI to, to medical imaging. In this example, you see a pediatric bone age, which is an algorithm we have deployed at Geister Thomas's. Um, however, we, again, we haven't seen the kind of transformation we think that is possible. Uh, and uh, this is where our work with the AI deployment engine uh, as part of the London AI Centre is really trying to do for AI what DICOM did for, for the X-ray. Um, and um, I've got a couple more slides, but uh, I'm, I'm conscious of the time that I've taken up um, and I want to pass on to uh, the, the rest of the panellists to have a bit more of a deep dive. But I just wanted to take the opportunity to say that at the London AI Centre, we have recognised this, this key challenge around the system integration to make sure that we have uh, an enterprise-wide platform like AID that is able to integrate with our PACs and EHR systems, that is able to receive uh, clinical data and trigger AI-driven analysis in a way that is safe and robust. And um, there's also a helpful demo of our system, which is currently live in a number of hospitals, or will be live in a number of hospitals um, by early next year. And um, the demo will be available online uh, on YouTube, so I won't go through it now. But I hope that's been a good intro in terms of setting the scene around some of the challenges that we'll be facing uh, or that you'll face when trying to integrate AI into the into the clinic and into the front line. With that all being said, I'd like to now hand over to, to Dr. Neelan Das um, to talk a little bit about his experience integrating AI into the clinical workflow at, at East Kent. Over to you, Neelan. Can you hear me? Sorry, it's... Uh... Uh, thanks very much for uh, inviting me to this uh, clinical forum. Um, <clears throat> really, I think uh, just uh, taking it forward from what Harris has just said, um, I'm going to just present my experience from uh, East Kent uh, Hospitals NHS Trust uh, and how we went about uh, uh, deploying and implementing an AI solution, which is actually still in the final stages of implementation. I'm just going to uh, share my slides here. <clears throat> Do you think you can uh, share my slides for me because it's not coming up here? Yep, I'll just put them up now, Neelan. The slide should be up. Great. Thanks a lot. So um, I think the idea I had uh, back in actually 2017, um, actually, if you can just scroll to the second to last slide, because I'm talking about implementation, but I want the almost first thing in your mind to be this slide here. And uh, this is 
my experience and I work in a pretty large DGH, um, but it's not a teaching hospital. And it's about 50 miles from London and some people sometimes say it's 50 years behind London, but um, with that tongue in cheek comment in mind, I actually think we've made some significant strides um, in just changing culture. Now, the first slide said implementation of AI, but it's actually not. This is not about implementation of AI. It, to my mind, this is about implementing a cultural change or human change to try and get this technology in and trying to persuade people of its benefit. So I had the idea um, in 2017, believe it or not, to um, investigate a couple of the technologies that seemed relatively mature for or ready for a possible deployment uh, in the hospital environment, and they were chest X-ray technologies. So my journey was to contact uh, two companies, and even that, um, after I'd contacted the two companies, um, I then asked them to come down to our hospital to uh, give a pitch as to what they could offer and where their benefits might be. So again, so once a uh, one gap straight away was even organising that meeting uh, took about six months or so. So if we now go to my second slide, so if we go back to the beginning. Yeah, second slide. So this was about a chest X-ray um, evaluation software, which Harris showed a, a beautiful chest X-ray earlier. And you can see here how we're demonstrating that um, this chest X-ray software can pick up where there's a lesion. It could potentially list out the lesion almost instantaneously, which will help clinicians on the ground in the middle of the night or um, it would, the idea was that we could prioritise a work list of chest x-rays into normals and abnormals for radiologists to then be able to attend to more quickly. At the time in our uh, trust, and which occurs in several trusts across the country, uh, most of the chest x-rays were not being looked at by a radiologist, only the ones that had been referred by a GP, which presents a huge clinical risk. Uh, so you can immediately see the benefit of being able to prioritise these x-rays into abnormal and normal. And the idea was if the abnormal ones were looked at very quickly within 24 hours and the normal ones were either left to one side or we did a 5 or 10% audit of the normals, then you've got a system which is better than that which we had before. Uh, next slide, please. So with that in mind, you know, this software could potentially pick out multiple different abnormalities. I won't go into them all. Next slide, please. Uh, we decided to get a thousand chest X-rays. Um, we had two radiologists evaluate the thousand chest X-rays again, uh, 250 roughly from each category of accident, emergency, general practice, inpatient and outpatients. And uh, next slide, please. And what we did was to integrate this system into our local system. Uh, you could see the idea here. Essentially, it was an on-premise solution. Um, our IG guys decided that they didn't want it going out to a server in a cloud somewhere, even if that cloud might have been based in the UK. So there's quite a lot of uh, pros and cons to doing that. Uh, in the end, we settled on an on-premise solution and that made the IG guys happy. Although if you think about it, teleradiology solutions go off the premises and go to uh, other providers. Um, and that is quite a traditional route and, and hospitals feel comfortable with that. But as soon as you say artificial intelligence, um, it seems to throw a spanner in the works. And so again, that's trying to change cultures. And I think we, we've managed to do that to some, to some respect. So if you can see here, the idea is, that the machine takes an X-ray, it gets sent to PAX, it gets sent to the middleman, which in this case was Cure, uh, was the uh, X-ray software, and then that um, generates a, a sort of screen image with a screen burn of what the report might be. It also can generate a natural language report, which will say it's an AI report, and then it can go and sort the radiologist's work list. But as I said, in the middle of the night on PAX, it'll be there, for example, for a clinician to review it um, at their leisure. So if we could go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> I came across all these icons on PowerPoint. And I thought I'm going to speak in pictures. So what it did, what did I do the first time when I, when I started this process? I was searching desperately in, in my trust. Who are the right people to contact? And that took me that six months to get that first meeting together. So the people at that first meeting was myself, a couple of interested 
inverted commas, innovative clinicians, um, the lead for radiology, the IT lead, the a representative of the procurement team, uh, the IG representative, the information governance representative. And um, actually, I also had subdivisions of the IT team there, the infrastructure team, the uh, someone who had an interest in uh, ethics for some reason, which was good at the time. I was quite surprised at that, but that was great that we had someone there. So I made my list of people. And then I had to really scratch my head. How was I going to organize this to get those those members of the teams on board? Um, anyhow, at that meeting, it was decided uh, on one of these providers. And the next thing that was to occur was how do we actually get this provider integrated into our hospital system? At the time, the procurement team said, well, you need to get these guys on the G Cloud framework, which was some a framework which makes it easier to get uh, technology companies into your hospital. But uh, that um, process actually didn't need to be done, but we spent about a year trying to do that because we just missed the deadline to get that company onto the G Cloud. They weren't from the UK, they were outside from India, so they had no knowledge of all of this. So we were also trying to assist this company to get them uh, familiar with the UK processes. But it took a lot of speaking, a lot, a lot of emails, a lot of non-response to emails. Um, as I said, I spent about a year just trying to get procurement to sign off some documents and in the end the documents that they signed off were the very same ones that were produced within the first week. So nothing really changed. Um, even getting mobile personal mobile numbers of of the various uh, uh, stakeholders to try and cajole them. Uh, telephone calls, but I felt like things were falling on deaf ears at that time. And of course, then this little pandemic hit at some point about a year and a half into the project. And that really threw things out of the window. The, I think um, the procurement team were really overwhelmed and that really um, slowed us down. Anyway, as a result of that, I managed to build a network of people. And we're now at the stage where I was able to do the evaluation that I just mentioned, and that was only just completed in uh, late 2020. And that evaluation in the end only took me two or three months, but the process to get that evaluation done took me, well, even if you took 18 months out for COVID, took me about two and a half years. But I've built a good relationship. I think we get on. It was climbing uphill. I felt I was drowning, but we've now hit a light bulb moment. So if you go to the next uh, slide. <clears throat> I've got my list of people. And I think what we might find in various organisations is you've got the top, the C-suite saying, yeah, let's go for it. Let's do AI. We really want it. It's going to change everything. It's amazing. The CEO was, Neeland, please take it forward. The CFO was, I back you. How much do you need? The chief information officer was like, yeah, we should do it. Chief clinical information officer, another new role. Yes, we should do it. The non-execs, oh my God, this is amazing. Can it really read a chest x-ray? And me saying, yes, it can if it was actually allowed to work. Um, and then on the other side, we got procurement team. We got the procurement team. We got the procurement team. We got the IT team, the IT infrastructure team. And actually, they were brilliant. The information governance team were brilliant. The department leads, they were brilliant. The business managers, they need a lot of convincing. The department admin leads, they need a lot of explanation of why they're having to spend their time to help you get in touch with other people. The deputy leads, when the leads aren't there, they need time to be explained to. The R&D team, they're very helpful, but they do research. Is this research or is this an implementation? Am I falling into a gray area? Oh, is it research? Well, then there's a whole load of other things. So there's a lot of convincing. I think there's a lot of, in places such as where Harris comes from, they're very you know, mature, they have their processes, they've done a lot of this kind of stuff before. Um, I think in other hospitals where this stuff is actually going to be implemented and come in useful in reality, there's a cultural shift that needs to occur. And that slowly is happening and it will happening. It will happen. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so just to go back to the actual evaluation, 
because we said uh, Harris uh, mentioned, um, you know, is it useful? Well, out of those thousand X-rays, 162 were normal, so that's about 16 percent. The rest were either abnormal or a third of them needed to be reviewed as defined by the uh, AI technology. That means about 16% of them you could put to one side. The other 85% have to be looked at by a radiologist. Now at the moment, if our radiologists aren't looking at them, we're not spending money on them looking at them. But now we're going to have to spend money on them looking at 85% of the x-rays. So it's not actually a cost saving. So therefore, should we just not bother with the chest x-ray AI and just spend the money on the radiologist looking at all of them because you're only going to save 15%. But on the other hand, 15% out of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of x-rays is actually quite a lot. So the decision was made by our clinical engagement board that we want to pursue this. And so despite, and then I presented this in uh, November of last year, and it's only just got through to business case planning tomorrow. So that's another year gone. But I hope after this, next slide please. Uh, next slide again. I'm conscious I'm running out of time. So I hope after this, after this business case planning, we'll then be able to go to the full integration, which is all ready to go. It's literally a touch of a button. Uh, we'll be able to then evaluate with our uh, emergency physicians who are chomping at the bit to get going. And uh, there we are. So I'll stop there because I think I'm running out of time. Um, uh, and there's a snapshot for you, Harris. Thanks. Thanks so much, Neil. And that, that was fantastic. There, there's so many massive issues that, that you've touched on in your topic things like business cases cloud versus on-prem uh, even things like who needs to be involved in, in these conversations uh there's there's things we can learn from um the work that was done by the global digital exemplars and their blueprinting work but we can touch on that maybe in the discussion uh, thank you so much for that neil and, and and from bringing some numbers to the party as well um that's always helpful um next i want to pass the mic to dr mike nix um, no pun intended, uh, is me talking about his work at, at Leeds and at NHSX. Over to you, Mike. Thanks, Harris. Uh, I've got to tell you that joke's been done. Um, anyway, can you see my uh, can you see my screen there? No, not yet. Oh yeah. Sorry, I don't seem to have a share button. Uh, oh. Sorry, technical issues here. I can see myself. Yeah. Okay, so now it says it's presenting. Sorry, this is, uh, I think because I'm using two screens and it's all just jumped onto one screen, um, it must be this uh, new type of uh, Teams. Right, OK. Is that, can you see the slides? Not yet. No. Mike, right, shall we skip to Anna while you get that figured out? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's a Teams issue. I'll sort it with Aidan, sorry. No worries. OK, well, Mike will have to keep you waiting a little bit longer. Um, Anna, sorry to spring it on you, but um are you happy okay. to take over yeah yeah i'm ready i'm ready although um i, I don't feel like i need to say anything neil has said it all <laughs> i've just got prettier slides maybe i don't know <laughs> let's just start sharing my screen okay how's that looking Yep, we can see your slides. Right. Oh, I haven't started at the beginning. Let me just go back. Oh, shoot. Um, thanks so much for the invitation and also uh, the introduction, Harris. Um, also, apart from the academic career I've had, I am currently the uh, regional chief healthcare scientist for all of the Southeast region. And um, what's frustrating in that position is is all of the things that Neelan tells you that's going on in Kent at the moment we want to roll out across the whole region and everything that he's talked about happens in every single hospital um, 
we're hoping with the advent of the imaging networks and the integrated care systems that it will start making things a little bit easier. But it, unfortunately, um, all those things are still there. OK, so let me tell you about the King's Technology Evaluation Centre, KITEC, of which I am the director. We're part of the London Institute of Healthcare Engineering, uh, which is, of course, itself part of the School of uh, Biomedical Engineering and Imaging Sciences. And we're based at, on the fifth floor at Beckett House. So um, just to recap, what we were supposed to be telling you about today um, is that we have the challenges to deployment in AI in the NHS. And I'm going to tell you about this part. Does it actually make a difference to patient outcomes? It's my favourite phrase when you all come to me with these wonderful, brilliant, fantastic ideas and it's really cool engineering and I just go so what and then everyone gets annoyed anyway so just tell you a little bit about the infrastructure of the team so as I said we're part of the biomedical engineering and imaging sciences which is uh, and and we're also a department within the London Institute of Healthcare Engineering and we're a lot we work alongside the Centre for Medical in Engineering and also the AI Centre for Value-Based Healthcare within KITEC um, we are, are a mixture of uh, project managers, a team of health economists, healthcare technology assessors and medical statisticians. And we work in partnership um, and in fact have dual positions, dual roles with the hospital uh, medical physics engineering department, Harris's computers and science and also um, the clinical engineering department. We also draw on expertise in the research design service, uh, infrastructure within the clinical trials unit, uh, King's Health Economics, uh, Implementation Science, which you haven't already heard of it, go and talk to them, fantastic group of people, mainly around um, technology and mental health, but are looking to partner up with us more on um, medical technology in general, and also the really important behavioural change part. So we've partnered up with a, a company called Respio, which work on behavioural science and change improvements planning. So this is KITEC in particular, as I said, work alongside Centre for Medical Engineering, the AI Centre Value Based Care and together we make up the KITEC team and we primarily concentrate on the evaluation of real world implementation. What does that mean? OK, so Neilan actually alluded to this. I found a, a, a nice uh, colour matching um, slide um, and it's all about the adoption curve. Um, so here we have, they, they've chosen this sort of, you know, mixture of let's do it right now, people, pragmatists, um, the conservatives or the, the sceptics or Luddites. Um, and, you know, I'm sure you've heard all of these kind of little comments that you get when you go along to your department and say, I've got this really brilliant idea. And someone says, oh, my goodness, AI, we haven't even got the basics yet. Oh, what just happened? Can you still see my screen or can you see my mm -hmm. screen? <laughs> can you see my screen now or do I have to go back again? <laughs> no, I think I have to reshare. Yeah, uh, just, just reshare and we'll pass it. Super. Now? Thank you. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. OK. Um, yeah, so. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't need it. I don't have time, um, which Neilan alluded to. Um, I was really surprised about the finance officer. I've always been um, get pushed back of how much does it cost. Someone else's income stream is going to get reduced by you introducing it. How much will it save overall? Oh, God, not another new thing. Anyway, it's all the usual stuff. Um, and this this bit here is actually much larger, I think, in the NHS than what they've shown on this uh, curve here. I actually think this is probably all of the middle part. So let me let me give you an analogy. When you think about convincing the NHS to use your kit, think of, think about this analogy. Convincing your gran or granddad to move from their favourite Nokia phone to buy the latest iPhone 13. I love my Nokia. Why should I spend all that money on an iPhone? I only need it to text or call. Think about your audience. So 
this, this might be a bit unfair on some of the finance people, but I always think of the finance people in hospitals or in the NHS England is, is your grand or granddad who say, well, you know, look, it just needs to do this. That's all we're interested in. That's what we've budgeted for. I don't understand why we need to spend more money. Why do I want all your fancy new fangled things? I don't get it. It's going to cost more money. Um, I like to think of um, the patients as more like our mum and dads who, um, you know, are kind of interested and then you can tell them it's really cool, mum, because then you can track where I am all the time and I can share photos with you and then we can we can share and we can do all this really cool stuff. And then the patients are going, yeah, 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 that's really good. And your mum and dad's going, yeah, 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 it's really good. I know where you are on a Saturday night. Um, and then you've got the people in the hospital who are going to be using it. And I always think about this as our kind of, uh, you know, siblings and our, our friends as well. And you're saying to them, it's absolutely amazing. You can configure it to do this and that. And it'll wake you up in the morning and you put these apps on and it'll just speed up your workflow. And it's really great. And I know it takes a little while to get used to going from a Nokia to an iPhone 13. But believe me, after a week, you won't regret it. and You'll never go back to anything else. And then you've got that early adopters in the in the um, in the curve, which is, of course, you or I think about our children who come to us and say, oh, no, 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 I've got this really great thing. Please, can we buy it? Please, can we buy it? Anyway, I hope you're with me on that. Um, I, I remember confronting the um, image division manager once when they turned our uh, business case down for a new pet CT yet again, and it's already 12 years old. And he had his phone with him. And I said, imagine if I told you you weren't allowed to upgrade your phone for another five years. And he just looked at me and went, ouch, harsh. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, that's the analogy I need to go with because people understand that one. OK, so what are we talking about? Right. When you drop your new tech and in this place, we're talking about the AI into the NHS, there is a ripple effect. It's like dropping a stone into a pond. And it isn't just even looking, speeding up the clinical pathway. It's it's everything else around it. And this is where you might recognize some of these words from health economics modeling, where you've got cost opportunities, you've got cost effectiveness, cost consequences. And all of this can be loosely put under clinical effectiveness. OK, so what has that got to do with Kitec? Well, basically what we are is healthcare, healthcare technology assessment center. Um, and you can equate that really doing a gap analysis of where your tech is going to fit. Now, I've, I've lifted this from the rather lovely um, engineering for better healthcare toolkit at University of Cambridge. Um, and this is the steps that they suggest you go through. So um, this is, you know, sort of their speak, but identify users and other system stakeholders. So this was my analogy about you know, who is it you're talking to? Is it which member of your family is it you're talking to? And understanding what their influence is. Are they able to veto? Um, will they um, will they be using it? Is it will they never come across it, but they will get the benefit of it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you need to really know about the current knowledge around your your technology and what its competitors are and where it's going to fit. Um, and then from that, you can define what your value added is and the clinical gap that you're filling it doesn't matter if it's cool. So that's, you know, if you, iPhone 13, fantastic. But if all you're saying is, oh, well, it's just a better way of doing texting and calling, no one wants to adopt it. Um, but having convinced them that, that actually it does fill a gap, you then have to think about what good looks like and how you're going to know when you got there. And so you need to think about benchmarking the technology against whatever improvement and it could be something way down the line you know it could be um you know we're looking at wearables now and uh, for for tracking people's um heart conditions and it could be something like do you know what actually it it saves them four trips to the hospital per month you know something's got nothing to do with your technology really but that's the kind of saving for the patient or or the or organizing the clinic out, out um, outpatient appointments but we and, and what we and we can help you do all this and the other thing we can help you do is is design the trials so we can help you look at these outcome values and we can help you design the trial properly to get these outcome values and then that's what we use our statisticians for and our health economists for 
um, and then you develop the schedule and operation plan and then you put it into implementation. And the other and what's wonderful about um, uh, the, our partnership that we have with GSTT is that uh, it means we've got a real understanding of how the NHS works. Um, I've worked in the NHS for, for at least 20 years and I know I, I, I love listening to you all come to me and tell me these wonderful pieces of kit that you've got. And all I'm thinking about is, oh, God, this is going to be an absolute nightmare to convince people to use in the hospital. Um, but all is not lost. Um, there is funding out there that you can go and get and we can help you apply for that funding and be in, involved in your bid as well. So the NIHR do a lot of stuff around this real world implementation. You've got the HTA funding, you've got the i for i Connect, which also has the AI awards in it. You've got research for patient benefit. It's a small one, but sometimes it can be good just to do this bit of work. Uh, and then of course, Innovate UK are part of the big, um, uh, big uh, funding landscape. So really in, in conclusion then, it's never too early to start thinking about gathering that real world evidence. So please come and talk to us um, and we'll um, try and help you get get further on uh, in this sort of fluffy world that isn't about engineering and computing. So um, that's me. I finished. Thank you very much. And I will hand over to Mike who hopefully has um, got his screen sorted. Thanks, Anna. Mike. Yeah, let's try this again. Right, so hopefully you can now see that. Yes, we can. Can you see the full screen version? Mm, no. No, OK, I don't think I'm going to be able to do that, so I'm just going to have to use this version because uh, full screen sharing was what blew things up last time. Um, so I'm Mike Nix. Uh, I work uh, in various places, uh, primarily in Leeds Teaching Hospitals, um, but also uh, at the moment for Health Education England and for NHSX uh, as part of their AI lab. And what I've done is really try to put together a little bit of a presentation around the idea of confidence for AI in healthcare, um, and particularly uh, what I term appropriate clinical confidence. So let's uh, just start with a little bit of um, background on, on where I've come from. Um, I'm a radiotherapy physicist by background um, and really my introduction to AI in healthcare was through uh, automatic segmentation of medical imaging uh, with deep learning. So for radiotherapy we spend somewhere between two and five hours per patient uh, manually delineating organs on their CT scans slice by slice. Um, and we do this so we can design their, their treatment and personalize it. Um, and this has been the case for you know, 20 years or so in, in radiotherapy, and it's by far and away um, the most time consuming and therefore expensive part of uh, treating patients. Uh, and that includes the cost of the, of the very expensive machines that we use. Um, it's still more expensive uh, to actually get the human time as, as usual. Um, the first AI solutions for deep learning segmentation that were CE marked and, and commercially available appeared around about 2018 um, and we started investigating around 2019. Uh, so obviously there's a high reward here uh, potentially in terms of workflow savings, um, but there's also a high risk because uh, radiotherapy is an inherently risky area. Um, irradiating people with large doses of, of radiation is something you have to get right. Um, so the need for clinical confidence and for safety and for validation uh, is, is very clear from, from the outset. So uh, moving on, um, if we want appropriate clinical confidence for an AI system, uh, we started thinking about some of the uh, key components that we needed to achieve that. Um, and, and we were thinking about this from a departmental perspective. Uh, so really looking at things like how do we educate uh, our staff, how do we prepare the ground uh, to enable us to, to roll this out and, and use it clinically. So obviously the first thing you start with is, is validation um, and implementation. Uh, and I'm starting approximately where Harris put a red X on that slide that showed the uh, AI development workflow. So we kind of hit the wall at the point of uh, local evaluation. In fact, in this particular situation, uh, we were even worse off because this model is provided to us with uh, some trained examples, um, but obviously you can segment different organs in different parts of the body. So this algorithm actually arrives untrained and you can train it yourself locally. 
So this goes from being a local evaluation problem to actually a local model training and evaluation problem, uh, which adds huge amounts of complexity um, and really stopped us in our tracks and made us think, right, what skills do we need to be able to do this? Do we have those skills? And, and clearly the answer at that time um, was no. Um, but since then we've we've moved on um, and we've we've built our skills base and our clinical scientific computing team. Um, and we're now in a position where we have done and can do uh, what we consider to be robust local evaluations. Um, and those local evaluations critically are based on our clinical workflows. So we're evaluating the usability of the product for our clinical workflow with our data. And I think that's an important um, important thing to point out is not just about your cohort, your patients, your data, it's about your workflows. Um, and that I think has to be built into the local evaluation. Um, coupled to that local evaluation and, and workflow um, aspect is traceability and governance. Um, so quality management is something that we're very big on in radiotherapy um, and ongoing monitoring fits nicely into that as well. So what we're doing is building a quality management system which enables us to go from our uh, products and our initial kind of fit for purpose evaluation um, and then the local evaluation and then the ongoing monitoring all built into this traceable quality management system. There's another aspect um, that is built on top of that we think to achieve um, clinical confidence and that's a technical robustness. Um, so this is the domain where you might find things like explainable AI, outlier detection, um, probabilistic estimates, confidence estimates coming from models. Um, and this is the piece of work that I did when I was um, a top off fellow actually, um, developing a solution called Auto Confidence, which I'll show you very quickly um, in a couple of minutes. But that really is a layer of, of product technical robustness um, that needs to be put over the top of all of the evaluation that's been done. And ideally it should be giving you confidence on a decision by decision basis. Um, and then the capstone, I guess, to the whole thing is education and communication because we need to educate our clinicians, our users of these systems in how they can assess appropriate clinical confidence. So to know whether in an individual case uh, they should have confidence in the output of the AI algorithm uh, or potentially not. Um, and that's a whole area that I've been involved in working with uh, Health Education England and NHSX. Uh, and again, I'll talk about that a little later on. Going back to the deep learning segmentation, um, this was the first model that we uh, trained and validated. It, it contours lungs, heart and, and breast. Um, the breast looks a funny shape and that's because it's actually the target for the radiotherapy in this case, which is why it has that definition. Um, it's a commercial model, uh, but we performed an in-house local validation. And that validation focused on this orange area up here, which is just this tiny intersection of the heart, the lung and the breast. And the reason it does is that that's the critical reason, uh, that's the critical region, excuse me, uh, for the radiotherapy dose. So it doesn't really matter what's going on down here at the bottom. Uh, it doesn't matter if the segmentation is poor because it doesn't affect the clinical treatment, but it matters very much if the segmentation has errors up here. Um, and so we focused our validation on that intersection region uh, and that allows us to have the clinical confidence that we need, that we can use this algorithm for this particular application uh, with the confidence that we need to deliver the treatment for the patients. So I said I'd talk very briefly about autoconfidence. Um, autoconfidence is an algorithm which sits alongside a commercial AI. Um, so this black box up here that says Ray Station, this is our commercial partner. Um, so this is their AI that takes CT images or MR images in fact, um, and segments them according to our clinical protocols. So we have an input, which is an image. We have a prediction, which is a segmentation. And then the question is, do we trust that segmentation? And in fact, do we trust all of it? Which bits of it do we think might not be trustworthy? Autoconfidence is a separate AI system, which we train here uh, in-house in Leeds, um, which takes both the input image and the prediction from the commercial model and assesses how much confidence we should have in them. And it identifies and localizes potential errors um, it's reference free. We don't need ground truth to, to estimate errors. Um, and when this is fully implemented, it will reduce risk and it will also allow us to improve efficiency by getting the most benefit we can out of the commercial solutions that are available to us. So this is what it does. It takes a segmentation and it predicts an error um, on the right hand side in the right column. 
Um, and in the middle, you see the ground truth errors, which you wouldn't normally have available, but they're there for reference um, to show the performance here. Uh, the top row is a good segmentation, minimal uncertainty, minimal error, um, and auto confidence is, is quite happy with that. Um, the middle row, we've applied some deformations and you can see the red regions here have been picked up as errors. Uh, and then in the bottom row, you've got some organs which are completely missing from the segmentation. Um, and again, they're flagged up as, as being missing. Um, so this is the kind of approach that we're taking to developing uh, sort of second line tools which can give us clinical confidence in high risk scenarios, which enables us to get the most efficiency and also the lowest risk out of the commercial tools that are available. Uh, how am I doing for time? Um, yeah, I've got, got a few minutes. OK, um, so moving on to what I've been doing with uh, NHS X and Health Education England. Um, this is a collaboration between the AI Ethics Initiative and the DART Ed uh, program, which stands for Digital Artificial Intelligence and Robotic Technologies in Education. Um, so it's been a really exciting uh, project to be involved in. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just going to have to <laughs> drag that off the screen or delete it um, so we can see what's underneath. So what we've been looking at is the um, things that are necessary for uh, confidence in AI for healthcare. Um, and we've divided the workforce, if you like, into five AI archetypes. Uh, so at the top of the pyramid, we've got users. Uh, and users are people who make clinical decisions uh, with AI, not necessarily just people who make clinical decisions, but they're the ones who have, have most need for uh, sort of per decision confidence um, and appropriate confidence. And at that point, what you're doing really is assessing the confidence that you should have in an algorithm or product or an implementation. Um, and then below that in the pyramid, uh, you've, you're relying on embedders. So these are the people who implement, uh, evaluate and integrate your systems um, and do your local evaluations and things like that. Um, and that really is a, is a confidence building role. So the idea there is to maximize confidence, whereas the idea for the users is to assess confidence. Uh, and then beneath the embedders, we have co-creators. Um, so these are people who will be working either with industrial or academic partners to identify problems, develop products and solutions. Uh, we've got drivers who are people in organizations, in uh, NHS organizations who are involved in prioritization and procurement. Uh, and then we've got shapers who might work in sort of uh, arm's length bodies or other organizations and are, are sort of more involved in the policy and the regulation side. Um, and what we're doing is identifying knowledge and education which we need to provide um, as Health Education England uh, to these various archetypes, these various groups of people in order to build confidence up uh, to this dotted line here, uh, which is the baseline confidence that you should have in a well-designed, well-implemented AI product. And then we need to educate our users, our clinicians and, and our other users uh, to assess confidence on a case-by-case -case basis um, so that they can have the appropriate amount of confidence in all the clinical decisions uh, that they're making. So just to sum up, this is where we are in Leeds at the moment. Um, we are developing a broad AI implementation strategy, uh, which is in the very new bioinformatics and scientific computing team. Um, we are working on translational research for things like autoconfidence with clinical impact, and a lot of that work is supported by Cancer Research UK. Um, and we're also commercializing some of this um, and uh, working with the University of Leeds to, uh, to do that um, and, and with some commercial partners as well. Uh, so I hope that gives you a flavour of some of the things that we're doing to build confidence, to educate our staff and to prepare the ground um, to do the kind of things that Harris is talking about uh, in terms of becoming a centre who can uh, evaluate and um, deliver AI to the clinical front line. That's me. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Thanks, Mike. That's That's been incredibly helpful and insightful around some of the technical and, and non-technical aspects around building confidence. And that's what it is, is it's building it and it's a multi-layered approach. Um, and one of the key aspects of, of building confidence in technology is, is having standardised ways of grading and evaluating such technologies. And now I'll pass over to, to Dr. Danny Ruta, who will be, who'll be able to tell us a bit more work that he's been leading on with the British Standards Institute. Over to you, Danny. 
Thanks, Harris. Um, I'm not even going to dare to try and share my slides, so I'm going to ask Matt if Matt, you could uh, work the slides for me. Um, and uh, I just want to say, um, Neelan, uh, I had a, an anxiety inducing uh, deja vu listening to your presentation. Um, <laughs> if it's any consolation, uh, a big eight, 800 year old beast like Guy's and St Thomas's, um, it's even harder to make things happen quickly in AI. So uh, I don't know if that's any consolation at all. Um, and, and I'm going to apologise up front to the audience that this isn't going to be a sexy presentation about insanely cool AI like autoconfidence or cure. It's about the much more prosaic subject of standards. Um, but I, I hope that by, by half seven uh, we'll all agree that as all this cool AI starts to, to find its way into clinical practice, that having agreed criteria and standards for what constitutes you know, safe, effective, cost effective and ethical uh, AI and healthcare is going to be absolutely critical over the next couple of years. Um, next slide, please, Matt. So the background to the, the BSI national standards work that we're currently doing um, kind of starts here at Guides Cancer back in early 2018 when we began our first clinical evaluation of IBM Watson Health's uh, Watson Froncology uh, at Guides Cancer. Um, we quickly realised that there was a real dearth of real world clinical evaluation globally um, and that's when Majid Kazmi, our then Chief of Cancer, uh, developed a vision for Guides Cancer as the go-to place for independent clinical evaluation of AI technology in cancer care. So fast forward to May 2019 and I was appointed AI clinical lead at Guides Cancer. I think I was only the second person in the NHS to have that title after Inver Joshi. Although Neelan, I think you were AI clinical lead in all but name really from 2017 by the sounds of it at East Kent. A um, couple of months after me, I think Amrita Kumar was appointed as AI clinical lead. She's a radiologist at Frimley Park. Um, and then we started developing uh, a, a collaboration with Kitech. Um, we think of ourselves as being powered by Kitech. And, and as you saw from listening to Anna, um, having Anna collaborate is like having a nitroglycerine tank strapped to the side of your car. Um, it's um, we, we, we really are powered by Kitech. Um, so the first question that, that we asked ourselves was, you know, how do you evaluate if an AI product actually does what it says on the tin? You know, what criteria and standards for validity should we apply in any AI clinical evaluation? Um, so we did a, a, a rapid review, um, which rapidly revealed that there was no international or, or even national consensus really on, on AI validation in healthcare. There was lots of good work going on at that time by the likes of NICE, NHSX, the Alan Turing Institute, WHO, the FDA, uh, even the Academy of Royal Medical Colleges. So um, next, next slide please, Matt. So we, we took the best of those ideas, we synthesized them, summarized, distilled them down into our own uh, draft AI validation framework. Um, we boiled it down to 18 criteria of validity, which you can see there, that could be applied at various stages in the AI product development lifecycle, from product inception right the way through to development, assessment, early adoption, routine implementation, and, the, and then routine monitoring. Um, <clears throat> next slide, please. So for each of those criteria, we identified the key questions that you'd need to address to evidence that a criterion had been met. So you can see here the, the, the criteria and the questions uh, at the product inception stage. Um, I won't go through this in detail because we're, we're, we're short on time now. Next, next slide, please. But these are the criteria, some of the criteria at the product de uh, development stage. Um, and you can see on the right uh, that um, we've We've tried to align the questions to the technology readiness levels that the European Commission uses to define the readiness of technology. So, and within each of those TRL levels, we try to identify the kinds of validation studies you'd need to do to answer the questions. And we took that from the uh, NICE evidence standards. Uh, next slide, please. Some of the criteria uh, around at the product assessment early adoption stage. Next slide, please. And then this is the last criterion at the post market uh, routine monitoring stage and, and some of the questions you'd want to evidence. So um, 
what happened next was we, Harris and I were um, invited to join a, a working group at BSI on AI medical devices. So BSI, British Standards Institution, it's the UK National Standards Body. In fact, it's the world's first international standards body formed in 1980, 1901, sorry, um, uh, on the day that Queen Victoria died. <laughs> um, the, um, the AI, this AI medical device working group produced this white paper in 2020, and one of its key recommendations was to develop BSI standards for the use of AI in healthcare. Next slide. And that led in February 2021 to the kickoff meeting of British Standard 30440 on the use of AI within health and care. Um, and a decision was taken quite early on to use our GSTT criteria and validation framework as a starting point to develop national standards. Um, but an extensive literature and landscape review was undertaken by the committee uh, to help build on, on the GSTT framework. Next slide, please. I think it might be helpful at, just at this point to very quickly explain, you know, what is a BSI standard and what it isn't. Um, it, it's it's an agreed way of doing something. It provides a reliable basis on which common expectations can be shared regarding specific product characteristics. Uh, and it results in a document which is established through consensus and approved by a recognized body, in this case, BSI. Next slide, please. How does it relate to the law? Well, standards are entirely voluntary. Um, they're not themselves contractual, uh, but they can be called up within regulations, within statutory regulations, that doesn't happen very often, or users, suppliers, developers can commit themselves to comply with standards through a contract. Next slide, please. This is probably of, of greatest relevance. How do the standards relate to medical regulation? Um, so European standards, uh, are often harmonised, uh, and that means that if you follow the specific requirements in the standard, you effectively meet the requirements in the regulation. Of course, we're no longer in the EU, in the EU um, and I think M MHRA is working with BSI at the moment to see if we can develop a similar a similar approach, which we'll call UK designated standards. Um, Rob Turpin, I think, is is in the ch is in the chat at the moment. Rob, is the, uh, this is a quote from Rob, who's the head of uh, healthcare for BSI, and I think Rob will uh, will be able to take some questions in the chat. And if we don't have time, he can um, follow up, and we can circulate some of his responses later. Next slide, please. And um, if you can read this, you can see that the the makeup of this standards committee uh, spans uh, academia, healthcare. Uh, and industry, um, and that includes NHSX and MHRA itself. Next slide, please. So, precision is everything with these standards. That we, we have these are a particular type of BSI standard called a specification, which means it's made up of requirements. Um, and these are shall statements. You shall do this. You shall do that in order to conform and comply with the standards. Next slide, please. So we had to turn our GSTT framework into something which was much more precise, much less ambiguous um, and auditable. Um, so this is just one example. So if you take, we took the GSTT criterion of relevance um, and that question that relates to relevance, which is, you know, what is the health question relating to patient benefit? And you can see here, this is how the committee has turned that into uh, an auditable specification. Developers shall demonstrate that a clinical patient or population health need is being addressed. And then underneath that, we've tried to describe precise, as precisely as we can, the evidence that you'd need to evidence that you're complying with that specification. Next slide, please. And I'll give you one more example. Um, this is later on in the development life cycle. This is at the product assessment stage. This is the criterion of external validity. And the GSTT question was, are the results reproducible in settings beyond where the AI was developed? And you can see how the committee has turned that into this auditable standard, um, which is much more detailed. Um, 
you know, which, which says, you know, developers shall state the specific intended purpose for which there is evidence of reproducible performance of the product. For each intended purpose, developers shall provide evidence of the impact of novel settings, including but not limited to a more recent time period, a different geographical or institutional setting, a different organisation setting. Um, and then we've tried to provide examples of the kind of reports or published papers that will provide that evidence that demonstrates that you've complied with that particular recommendation. Next slide, please. Just to finish, um, this is the schedule that we're working to. We're, we're still in the drafting stage. Um, we're going to have a, a, an internal expert consultation process and then we'll move to a public consultation, hopefully uh, in January next year. And we're aiming to publish the national BSI standards. We're not sure what it's going to be called yet. The working title is uh, AI in health and care. It could be safe and ethical AI. It could be safe and effective AI. We're still deliberating. And it could be health care or it could be health and care, implying that it can be applied to AI in social care settings as well. It's all up for debate at the moment. We hope to publish in April, May 2022. Next slide, please. Yeah, and that's it. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Danny, um, for for the insight into some of the standards work that uh, that we've been working on. I think it's a it's an important aspect of being able to scale up some of the the things that we've learnt. Um, I think I think that's one of the the key challenges and <clears throat> responsibilities we have as people that have been afforded the opportunity to take the lead in, in, in this work around deploying AI, is to then figure out, well, how do we scale what we've learned so that as many people as, as possible can, can benefit? Thanks once again to, to everyone that's spoken so far. I think now we can take the opportunity to take some questions that have been uh, uh, put to us by the audience. I'm gonna start um, by bringing a couple of them together. There's a, there's a question, one by anonymous about um, development of AI in the NHS and and can we bring development and deployment together somehow into a more continuous process, particularly looking at the existence of medical physics and scientific computing teams. And then there is a, another um, uh, question by Mr. Fernando around aut your auto confidence work, Mike. Uh, and AI automation and teaching. Is there any feedback in terms of classifying the AI as a medical device? I'm, I'm, I'm guessing they're talking about auto confidence as well. And I think auto confidence is a is a good example to talk around both the medical device aspect, but also the in-house aspect. Um, what's your experience been like with auto confidence building something? at least partially in the NHS, if not wholly. Uh, and how do you see the, that continuity of processes going from your quality management system when you're developing it mm -hmm. and your quality management system once it's in live? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the first thing to say on this is it's definitely a work in progress. Um, auto confidence is not clinically live. Um, auto segmentation is. Um, what we're doing is we're taking an in-house uh, development approach, which is potentially slightly risky given what's changing in the medical device regulations at the moment. But um, I'm, I'm hoping that there's, there's still going to be that pathway uh, available to us in the future. The reason for doing that really is that we need to demonstrate clinical effectiveness of this tool in-house um, before we can go through a, a collaborative commercialization route, which would lead to C marking, which would then lead to um, marketability. Um, but I think the benefit of doing that really is that it forces us to uh, get our ducks in a row in terms of local evaluation and in terms of traceability and quality management. Um, and I think the conclusion that we're coming to is actually that kind of infrastructure and that kind of um, governance structure really is key to giving us the confidence as an organisation that we need to implement anybody's AI. Um, and almost from a local evaluation and, and quality management and ongoing monitoring point of view, we wouldn't really see a CE Mark commercial <laughs> AI coming in as categorically different to an in-house developed one. Uh, we would look at the published evidence, the available evidence. We would make decisions about how much local evaluation we needed to do. Uh, 
uh, we would we would treat it in a very similar way. So actually, that um, that kind of um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, that environment, that culture, is, is really quite transferable. We think. Um, just to pick up uh, on uh, just a small point and addressing one of the points in Ms. Fernando's questions around when do you engage the MHRA um, in, in that in-house process? So yeah, I, I appreciate that it's it's not live, it's still under development, so to speak. Yeah. At, at some point you'll engage the MHRA. We do you will. have any idea when that will be? Um, so what we're, what we're doing at the moment is we're gathering retrospective uh, data on, on efficacy and on efficiency. Um, we, I mean, we have a slightly unique position because we're an AI that assess, assesses the output of an AI, which is something that MHRA will not have ever seen before. Um, so, yeah, we, we've started initial conversations and we've been told get some data uh, and then come back and talk to us. So that's that's what we're going to do. So we're going to approach them sort of at the point where we're translating from what I would describe as a, a research context to a, a clinical evaluation context. Fantastic, understood. One of the other topics that, that has come out in a couple of presentations um, today is around collaborations with companies. Um, uh, Danny, I know that you, both you and I and you, you in specific do uh, a lot of work in co-development with, with technologies, uh, with technology companies. Neil, and you mentioned even really mundane things around educating foreign companies into about UK processes and procurement frameworks. Uh, um, I'll, I'll go to you, Danny, first. What do you think? Well, what, do you think that's necessary to to collaborate with companies in order to get fit solutions for the NHS? And what are the ingredients required at the NHS end to make those collaborations fruitful? Yeah. Um, I think the answer to your first question, absolutely yes. I think we're in a, com you know, the, the 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 kind of the old world where there were there were these demarcations between healthcare providers, industry and academia as well. You know, um, that's got to go. You, 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 we, we can't innovate at the, at the speed at which we're going to need to innovate um, in this AI re revolution without a much, much more um, collaborative relationship between academia, industry. And, and, and that, that means, you know, setting aside some prejudices, you know, um, scepticism, suspicion, um, but it also means the challenge of procurement <laughs> processes. Um, and I can see Neelan's just putting his hand to his head there. Um, you know, that, that, that's, a, that's a really, really big practical challenge. Um, you know, how, how, how do you enter into a collaboration where you you know, you, you may not you, you may not know until a couple of years into a contract whether you actually have a product that is cost effective within your local setting that you want to carry on using. Completely agree. Uh, Neilan, uh, when you when you were talking, you 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 listed one of the other important aspects around getting the right people around the table, um, and. And you you've got this working group now, this this network that you formed. We have similar ones at GSTT. Danny, you mentioned, or I can't remember Daniel Neelan mentioned Friendly Park. I don't know, they have a similar working group. What would have been helpful to you, Neelan, back in 2017-18, I guess, uh, in terms of figuring out how to go down this journey as efficiently as possible? Um, you know, when you walk into WH Smith and you see those guides, like an idiot's guide to Microsoft Windows, I would yeah. have liked one of those, an idiot's guide to getting AI into your hospital, and it would have started one, contact IT, two, contact procurement, they'll be difficult, if so, do this, do that, three, contact Guy's and St Thomas's uh, procurement team and get them to speak to your procurement team and offer their expertise. If you get stuck, speak to this person. As detailed, but as simple as that, to get the ball rolling. And that's what would have saved me about a year and a half. <clears throat> Beyond that, I think uh, it's all about education, which is, you know, the forums like this, or all the stuff we see. But really, it's still about 
whether it's central government or a body like NHSX or a, or a leading, you know, like Lee's Hospital or, or Guy's Thomas's, actually um, contacting the procurement teams and the IT teams of each trust in the land to say this is what's happening. Uh, it's the f it's the main future, so you need to educate your teams on this. Send a representative to this course or X Y Z. Thanks, Neil. Danny, you want to come back on that? Yeah, uh, to, to be fair to procurement, um, uh, it, you know, if, if you remember Anna's um, market adoption curve, you know, um, you know, if you want to be an innovator, an early adopter, um, as as a hospital trust, then you're going to have to be much less risk averse, um, and so financially, you're going to have to persuade, you know. Ex executives to invest money uh, in in a product which may not have much of an evidence base. In fact, you may be co-developing it with 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 the with the with the supplier. Um, if you want to be in the early majority, uh, you know, part of the curve, um, then there's a different challenge for you. Um, you you want to have some evidence. You want to you want to see the evidence. Um, and the problem there for AI is that you know, in the world of, you know, ph pharmaceutical drugs or surgical procedures or even medical devices, you know, it, it, there's several years of systematic reviews, Cochrane reviews, building up the evidence base before decisions are made and money, money, money changes hands and in medical, medical interventions are implemented and deployed. But AI is moving so quickly. Um, yeah. That there's not that time to 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 wait for that evidence base. It, it's the uh, you know the opportunity's gone by the time uh, you know you've got a systematic review. So that's a real challenge for that 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 part of the adoption curve, I think, going for going forward. Thanks, Danny. I just want to quickly bring in Anna here um, around the evidence generation. Right? There's a there's a question in the chat around you know is it necessary to conduct research with new AI technology before implementation? And Anna, you briefly mentioned that it depends. Right, and, and and Danny's pointed out that the pace that these things move at, and the nature of the technology itself, in terms of how it's developed and comes to market, makes it a much more nuanced question. So, Anna, in your experience, what are the different kinds of evidence generation that you've seen in this space, and what what's suitable and what's less suitable? Um, <clears throat> actually, <laughs> there really isn't very much, and Kitech are kind of blazing a trail in this. So. Um, we're, we, we've been appointed a, what's called a T-set by NHSX, which is um, a technology specialist evaluation team. And we're working with four companies at the moment to do exactly this, which is to generate the evidence. Um, and we have a lot of conversations with the expert advisory groups <clears throat> that have been put together by NHSX because NICE and NHS are still all about randomised control trials. And I'm sorry, but these are just not appropriate for the, what we're talking about. Not only do you need huge amounts of data to, to show any sort of effects, but also we can't control all those factors. It's not like a drug, um, a drug trial. And so um, we're beginning to educate people around um, what's Lucy termed sort of quasi-experimental methods, but sort of comparators and, and things like that. Mike can jump in in a sec. Um, <clears throat> um, and and actually what I would, and I, I've sort of mentioned it in our chat, I don't know if people would see it in the QA, is that um, is getting access to data because a lot of it's not to do with the tech itself, right? It's to do with the patients and the pathway. So what we really want to be able to do is get right into the electronic healthcare record systems and pull out what we need. Now there are some hospitals like yourselves, UCLH before and Abbey Brooks, who are going for things like Epic. But even there, you've then got to write a kind of pipeline that goes between um, translating all of their database fields into something that people understand. So you know what you can pull out. Um, and we've got to educate all the IT people and everybody, but people throw you know, go completely nuts as soon as you say GDPR and they pull down the shutters and everything. And it's and it's, it's a complete misinterpretation of the uh, legislation for a start. So um, 
so gosh i haven't got an answer um just that we're, be we're, we're just at the beginning where we're climbing the foothills um and, and part of kai Tech's kind of mission if you like is is to um build that confidence in the nhs about allowing us to do what we need to do quickly and in a different way so not randomized control trials without you know media storms about oh my god they're going to sell all our gp records everywhere uh mike i do you want to quickly jump in yeah yeah uh sorry it wouldn't let me unmute my team's just terrible tonight um you wouldn't think too many people were using it yeah, I was going to totally agree with you, Anna. Um, and I was going to say the other thing about uh, RCTs, of course, is the timescales that they take, um, which are just completely incompatible with the kind of life cycles and, and product cycles. Uh, and also, I think the the issue that these products are evolving, even if it's not a continuously training model, it will be a model which is updated periodically. And the idea that you'd want to generate evidence and have some sort of trial every time that happens is, is just impossible. Oh, Anna, go again. Well, yes, and, and of course, actually, that's not a new problem, Mike, is it? I mean, you know, yeah. you you have that, Harris, we all have that experience in bringing in new software, mm. image analysis, radiotherapy, exactly the same thing, exactly the yeah. same thing. And and um, and actually, so far, we've been able to come in under the radar. You know, you introduce a new reconstruction algorithm for PET imaging or a new, um, a new radiotherapy training, planning um, system, and it doesn't get put into this box and we just implement it and do our own local commissioning because that's what it is right it's commissioning yeah. um so so it's not new um but now it's got the real spotlight on it and it needs to be I changed think, yeah i think actually one of the one of the challenges we've got is getting that commissioning mindset outside of, of medical physics essentially and, and into the sort of broader context harris uh, thanks everyone i just uh, very conscious of the time uh, and we've gone yeah. slightly over just to be respectful of, of the audience's time and, and yourselves i just wanted to wrap up um just with one final question um and just one word answers um out of the various challenges and and solutions that that we've discussed uh, this evening what one do you have would you put money on in in, in terms of having the most impact in allowing us to achieve the kind of transformation that would be possible from AI. Um, it could be a policy document. It could be a dummies book that Needham pointed out. It could be a new staff, a new breed of staff. What do you think would be key in unlocking the, the transformation? Um, Needham, sorry, I want to pick on you first. Um, do you have anything that comes to mind? Neelan's uh, videos um, frozen, uh, Harris. Okay, the Neelan managed to get himself some more time, uh, Mike. Uh, oh, thanks. Um, I think I'm going to say um, informatics, and, and I mean that in the broadest sense. So we've got clinical scientific computing and bioinformaticians specifically, um, but I think informatics on a on a broader scale, people like the FCI, um, I think are going to be key to bringing this knowledge and, and educating our, our workforce across the board. Thanks, Danny. I think it I think it's got to be some way of ring fencing resources within the NHS, within NHS trusts uh, to be allocated to data analytics and artificial intelligence. Um, uh, otherwise, you're competing against such scarce resources for other priorities that always take precedence. And that, that will, that, that, what, what will happen is that the Googles and the Apples of this world will start to come into the healthcare and will end up with the NHS just being a, a safety net. Very good point. Anna. Well, I rather like Neelan's stocking filler idea of a dummy's guide to. Um, but actually reverse it round. So a dummy's guide to AI deployment and development um, for IT and IG and procurement teams in hospitals, but actually in the NHS England from the top down, right? Um, so I work at a regional level. We've started talking about it at a regional level. Um, and I think something like that would be good. And, and we will be having those conversations with the integrated care systems as well. Fantastic, finally, Neelan. Oh, thanks for giving me the final word, but can I, I'll have 
two words if that's okay uh, league tables how, how do you get points well you know that's up to someone to decide but uh, if you like uh, in surgical fields or when we publish our own data about how good or bad we are uh, if you turn this into a positive spin uh, or you know in interventional radiology we have centers of excellence and you have to you, you can apply to join a center you know become a center of excellence with ver ver various criteria you know that kind of league table it'll probably we need to create pressure in the nhs it's great to have all the standards the things that we're doing but that could be in my cynical view used as ways to slow things down and it's therefore trying to flip that culture to in all the standards that we're making they could be used as roadblocks rather than enablers so if you create that pressure to do well that's what i think will happen and league tables help <clears throat> Fantastic. No, that's a really interesting, really interesting idea. Not, not one that I, has popped into mind before. Um, fantastic. OK, uh, I think it's time for me to, to thank everyone for, for joining today, in particularly the, the esteemed panel. Um, I feel very grateful that I got to do this for this past sort of 90 minutes and um, being able to host the last SIN seminar series for the year. Um, so so thanks, everyone, uh, for joining for for the past six months to all the different seminars we've hosted. Big thank you in particular to Nadine Hashasharam for, for setting up the Clinical Innovators Network and who, who introduced the session today. Um, I just quickly want to thank everyone who's been part of the series um, for the past six months. We started with the, the launch event with Shauna Butler about her amazing entrepreneur nurse journey. Uh, and then Dr. James Teo kicked off the, the AI series around transforming healthcare with Chris Kelly from Google and Ro Rob Brisk um, from NVIDIA. Uh, and then Danny held the, the second series, or second in the series around practical applications of AI in healthcare with Deb Sarka, Phil Brealy, Piers Keen, and Parash Kev Natchev. Uh, and finally, everyone here today Dr. Danny Ruto again, Dr. Mike Nix, Dr. Neil Das, and Dr. Anna Barnes. Matt and Aidan for the work they do behind the scenes uh, for putting all this magic together uh, and making sure that it's relatively glitch free. Um, and finally, thanks to everyone who's been supporting us from the journey of the past six months. Um, everyone have a great winter break. Thanks for joining. Take care. <laughs>